rolling. It's a oh, yeah. yes. Hello again, it's me. Back for another slice of mojo and <laughs> we're on chapter seven now. Yeah, you remember me from the last video. Of the three amigos. Yes. <laughs> right. Chapter seven. Slice of mojo. Gods and demons. Oh god, what are we gonna get into now? Dead. A couple of weeks later, Rosie turned up at my flat with some coke and champagne. We were getting high and having a laugh. She asked me if I'd like to try some heroin. And me, with my addictive nature, said yes. And that was the worst thing I ever did. This became my downfall for the next ten years. Don't get me wrong, it was so Moorish that I couldn't stop. I would like to tell you now that that was not Rose's doing, but my own stupid fault. For trying anything that came in front of me, I started selling for Rosie to keep my habit going. After three to four months went by, all I thought about was my next hit and all my feelings inside. It had been removed. You think you have feelings on heroin, but you don't. So for the next 10 years, I was heaven and hell. Kidnapped. It was Christmas time coming up and I bought some coke to sell. I knew this guy called Paul had been, who I'd met loads of times and he phoned me and came to my flat to buy some coke. He told me it wasn't for him, but for two guys in the car outside. Like a fool, I said, OK, but I don't work this way normally. I picked two wraps up that I was selling for 100 quid each. So I thought 200 quid be handy for Christmas. I was just around the corner. We both went down the stairs to my flat and around the corner to the car. The back door of the car was open. I stepped into the back of the car. The driver span off with the car doors still wide open till we reached a corner of the road where the door closed itself. They drove me some miles out to the country and stopped the car miles from anywhere. They were two large Jamaican guys. The guy next to me on the back seat pulled a large knife out and I thought my time had come. And I thought I was going to die. I gave them the two wraps of coat that I was hoping they wouldn't kill me. I thought to myself my time is up and in a flash they kicked me out of the car and sped away from there. And I walked a couple of hours to get back home and swore to myself I would not sell my other five wraps which I still had at home. I kept the wraps until Christmas and shared them with my friends and had an awesome time. Moved to Threshold Street. A couple of months later, my parents asked me if I would like the house in Freehold Street to live. It was right next door at the pub. It used to be Mick Green's old house. I was in a van with Mick many years ago. I jumped at the chance and said, yes, it would be great for me so I could do a lot of work at the pub helping my parents out and do relief for them so they could have a month's holiday. The canal boat. About a year later, Rosie and Jim had just bought a canal boat and asked me if I would like to come to London with them for a week on the boat. By this time, summer was on the way and looked forward to it. I missed the first two days, so I had to meet them in Kingston-Bon-Thames. Posh place, Kingston-Bon-Thames. It was a beautifully hot summer's day when I got there and the sun was out until late. We stayed there for the night and made an early start in the morning. When lunchtime came around, we would go for lunch and a drink in one of the pubs along the canal. And we would carry on checking out all the countryside and wildlife. It was awesome. This was the Oxford Canal going to London. When we got there, we went out on the Thames and back onto the Grand Union Canal and stopped one night at the Camden Lock. There we would go out and have dinner at an Italian restaurant. After that, we carried on and tried some drinks in a few pubs on the way. We decided to cruise through the night to catch up for some lost time, as we had a deadline to meet to get onto the the Cropadi Folk Festival on time. We Cropady. got Cropady Folk, Cropady. Yeah. Cropady Folk Festival on time. We got there early in the day and it was heaving. All the pubs were packed in the small village, but we managed to get a few drinks before we went to the festival. There were lots of artists on, plus the bootleg Beatles, and at the end of the night, Fairpool Convention were playing. The following day, Rosie and Jim decided to stay another night, so I decided to hitch back home. But in the afternoon, I met some friends from Coventry and ended up taking some acid with them. After about an hour, I started to hitch home. 
I got a lift pretty quickly and started tripping in the car just before I got dropped off from around the corner from where I live. I turned the corner at Mason's going into Free Freehold Street where I live next door to the pub. I got close to my front door and there was a glass and there was glass from all my windows on the floor. I opened the door and it was all burnt down inside. I felt I was tripping big time, but this really happened. It was all to do with some faulty wiring ring which had been put in the house. All my possessions had gone, all my photos that I had in the house had gone, but I still had a photo album at my parents' pub, all my books with my own songs that I had written that cannot be replaced. I had a lady friend called George. She lived up the road from me and asked her if she could put me up for a month or two whilst I do the house back up, and she said she would. Working for Mayfair, I moved back into my house in Freehold Street and doing a few shifts for extra money until a job came up. I started working for Mayfair Security for Bangor Walsh. I worked in shops, nightclubs and on the door. Worked at the NEC for the bands, bus regular for the Chubby Brown concerts. They gave me a company car working all over the country. Halifax was refurbishing all their shops, so they had builders in all through the nights. I remember one occasion that I had to go to North Wales and stay there overnight and in the morning. I would get a phone call saying they would actually leave me for Bournemouth for another job at Halifax. This carried on for about six months, going to all different places. And I was getting worn down, not by having much sleep. So I handed my notice in and started working for my parents again for a couple of months. Scotland, here I come. Rosie and Jim sold their narrowboat and moved into a house in Coventry and bought a van to do up as a caravanette. They asked me if I would like to go on holiday with them to Scotland and I jumped at the chance because I'd never been to Scotland. There was no room in the caravanette so I took a small one-man tent with me. They would only stay one night in each place so we could see a lot more of Scotland. The first lock we got to was Loch Lomond. It was beautiful there. The next place I fell in love with was the Glencoe. I felt very much at peace there. I could have stayed there for the whole week. We toured all over the place, all the way up to Nomaness, then up to John O'Groats, and then making our way to the west coast, down the Isle of Skye, and then headed home. Scotland's a beautiful place. Denise and Tracy. Just got back from Scotland, and feeling pretty ill, I had the sweats and shivers when I got home. I was coming down from the heroin and found out the heroin had dried up. I knew a friend that might be able to help me and his name was Dops. He told me he had some morphine tablets which should help me out. After seeing Dops, I was back on track, feeling my normal self again. In the meantime, somebody dropped some speed off so that I could sell and put some money back in my pocket to feed my heroin habit. That night I bumped into Denise and Tracy, two local prostitutes, which I had been friends with for many years. They both drank in my parents' pub. I asked Denise and Tracy if they would like to cut up some speed for me and put it into wraps, and they both said yes. I would give them three wraps each for doing the work for me. The girls made £30 each off me for about two hours' work. They were both happy with that. Party at Dops. I left the Masons early and got a lift to Dops' party. I can't remember who drove me there, but I was pretty out of my head and all sorts of drugs. I remember we pulled into a small cul-de-sac with only a few houses there. Then there was a large field at the end of the road. My friend Stefan was there, and Jill, who I had not seen for years, and there were lots of other people there. But I didn't know in the corner of the room I noticed an acoustic guitar, so my instinct was to pick it up and play it. As soon as I started playing, Jill came over, grabbed my hand and said, come with me. So she pulled me off the floor and had just taken me outside down to the fields at the bottom of the road. She was very forward and started touching me all over and trying to take my clothes off. And I said to her, no, because she and I was going out with somebody. So she agreed not to and said, OK. We started walking back to the party. And as we got near to the house, she grabbed my hand and took me to her friend's house next door but he was at the party for the night. She opened the door and pushed me down on the settee and then she started. <laughs> Doing a strip in front of me and all her clothes came off. She grabbed my hand and led me upstairs and then she started stripping me. 
She was like a wild tiger with claws to match. <laughs> but what a beautiful body she had. We made love all night, until about eight in the morning. She made me some breakfast and then left. After breakfast, I went back next door. There was only a couple of people there, and I had no way of getting home. And Doc, with his kind heart, said, he will give me a lift. A few days later, I wrote a song about Jill called She Started Touching Me. Swings and roundabouts. After taking drugs for so many years, I really wanted to come off. I tried so many times, but nothing worked to me. I decided to get a methadone script to wean myself off, but I found after about a month they tried to wean me off too fast. I said to them, if you do that, I will be taking again. So they left me for a while and tried to wean me off again too fast. I knew people that had been on heroin for years, and just to feel normal on it, without having the sweats and shivers and holding down a job, this is all I asked for which they could not do. So I went back to the heroin. They could not help me. There you Thank go. you very much. All right. Yeah. You do that. Fantastic. Good. Let's, uh, how does that sound now? Thank you very much, Ian, for doing all that. And we might get you to do another one, yes? Yeah, not a problem at all. Because you do it so well. Thank you.